And prior to his appointment, Arshad was head of global banking business at Maybank Islamic Berhad, in which capacity he oversaw the bank's corporate banking, trade finance and investment banking business lines. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, Arshad has had a very career path since commencing his career in 1995 as a lawyer in Kuala Lumpur with Mirz Mohammed Ismail and Co. He specialized in corporate law, banking and finance law, and also Islamic banking and finance law. And of course, looking at the time right now, should be that uh, our Middle Eastern friends are tuning in currently. And of course, in the early 2003, I would like to share this fact, in fact. So he joins the IMB Islamic as one of the pioneer members where he focused on sukuk origination and execution before relocating to the United Arab Emirates in late 2004 to join HSBC Amana as the head of Islamic capital markets at HSBC Amana, Arshad and his team originated and worked on many innovative and groundbreaking sukuk transactions in the Gulf. And of course, Corporation Council region and Southeast Asia. So the other roles that he has held include head of asset management at Ion Capital and a boutique investment bank based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, head of corporate finance and advisory at Hilal Bank, an Islamic bank based in Abu Dhabi as well. And after that, Asha returned to Malaysia in 2011 to join the International Islamic Liquidity Management Corporation, IILM, as their executive director, origination and structuring. All right, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome and join me to welcome Mr. Arshad Mohammed Islam Ismail, Chief Executive Officer, BPMB Malaysia. Cheers, on. Hello, Mr. Arshad, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind and generous introduction. Thank you very much as well. So, Mr. Arshad, I heard that you have an amazing presentation to share with us here today in regards to the topic developing the present with the future in mind. With that, I would like to hand over this session to you for you to share your presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to apologize to participants. Uh, we should have started at two. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, the topic is a very broad topic. Uh, let me just uh, read the topic again to refresh our memory, developing the future with the present in mind. Uh, as I said, it's a very broad topic. It's relevant to every segment of society. It's relevant to every sector of the economy. And uh, with that in mind, I you know, have uh, decided to structure the presentation uh, in line with what you see on the screen. If we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, this will be less of a speech, it'll be more of a conversation. Uh, as I said, the topic is very broad. So I hope that uh, we will have an opportunity to have a conversation on uh, very important issues that uh, impact us as a society, both at the national level as well as at the global level. So I will talk about the big picture, uh, if we could move to the next slide. Uh, we will talk about uh, some of the commitments recently made in Glasgow during COP26. And then I will be talking about the guiding principles for sustainable development planning. Uh, and uh, this is a criticism uh, against uh, BPMB itself, because we are also going through a learning process. We do have certain initiatives already in place with regard to sustainable uh, financing sustainable development planning, but we have to constantly be uh, vigilant. We have to be critical of uh, the way we execute our duties and responsibilities and deliver on our mandate so that we are up to date uh, in terms of uh, what the society needs, what the country needs. And then uh, could I request the secretariat to move to the next slide, please? Thank you. And then uh, to continue with the discussion, I'll be uh, touching on the 12th Malaysia plan. So this is the uh, sustainable development conversation at the national level in Malaysia. And finally, I will talk about what we at Bank Pembangunan or BPMB have done in the context of uh, sustainable development. And then I would be more than happy to, as I said earlier, engage in conversations with participants and uh, 
you know, uh, delve into some of these uh, very important issues and uh, figure out where we are doing well and where perhaps uh, we need to be doing better. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As everyone, I'm sure, is uh, fully aware, uh, the COP26 event uh, was uh, held in Glasgow recently. And uh, there were many conversations, uh, government leaders, uh, policymakers were all present in Glasgow. And uh, they all signed up to certain commitments. And uh, let's uh, take a look at some of the key commitments that were made in Glasgow. Uh, now, before that, of course, I'm sure to put things into perspective, everyone agrees that climate change is a global emergency that must be tackled now. Uh, we don't have the luxury of time. We can't uh, tell ourselves, we can't tell uh, the next generation, we can't tell our children that we will start focusing on uh, climate change related initiatives uh, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, it might be too late. And this is uh, the sort of uh, story that we keep hearing uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And at the global level, we have seen many commitments and pledges being made with regard to achieving net zero targets. Of course, the level of quality of a commitment differs from nation to nation. The quality of commitment differs from region to region. And there are so many reasons for that uh, disparity. But in broad terms, <clears throat> commitments were made with regard to reducing emissions. Uh, there were pledges to cut greenhouse gas emissions significantly. And uh, there were pledges to reduce methane emissions by 30% by year 2030. Now, coal uh, is often, and pardon the pun, a hot topic. Uh, what is the problem with coal? Coal is responsible for 40% of annual CO2 emissions uh, globally. And uh, one of the commitments uh, made at COP26 was uh, to stop public financing for most fossil fuel projects by 2022. Uh, public financing means uh, fiscal expenditure, but there appears to be an escape clause. Uh, if you notice, uh, the word is for most fossil fuel projects. So I guess uh, certain countries would still have a need to support and fund uh, fossil fuel projects. And uh, finally, under the coal uh, pillar, you will see that uh, commitments were made to phase down rather than phase out. Now, uh, you might be wondering why not, you know, completely phase out coal. Uh, if you have been following the COP26 uh, discussions, you will remember that uh, two key nations uh, pushed back against uh, such initiatives, uh, namely China and India. And uh, of course, uh, they have a, a whole list of reasons for doing so. But that's why we ended up with a commitment to phase down uh, coal-related projects as opposed to phasing out. And finally, there were commitments made uh, in relation to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. Now, fossil fuel or petrol subsidies are uh, are common in many <clears throat> regions. And in Malaysia, we also have uh, petrol subsidies. And the argument relates to uh, managing the affordability of uh, living in big cities and beyond. And I'll talk about that a little later as we look into some of the problems associated with uh, honoring some of these commitments. Again, the way different nations honor these commitments uh, would be uh, different depending on their respective circumstances and also depending on uh, their respective uh, level of uh, development. And uh, <clears throat> on this slide, the final commitment that I would like to highlight is that uh, the policymakers have committed that uh, all new uh, cars and vans by 
2040 will be zero emission vehicles globally. So that's uh, an exciting commitment. Now, of course, uh, the question could be, uh, why 2040? That's a good 20 years away. Why can't we uh, do it much earlier? Uh, again, that's a very complex uh, conversation. It depends on how affordable uh, electric vehicles are. And even right now, whilst uh, we hear a lot about uh, the advances in technology with regard to EVs or electric vehicles, uh, in terms of affordability, it still remains out of reach of the average citizen, uh, definitely uh, out of reach of the average citizen in this country, Malaysia. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Here, I would like to highlight some of the uh, national level initiatives uh, for those who are tuning in from other parts of the world. I'm speaking from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So uh, what I'm highlighting here are initiatives that uh, Malaysia has committed to. And Malay in Malaysia, we acknowledge that uh, climate change is a serious issue. It's an issue that deserves attention uh, now as opposed to tomorrow. And uh, let me just run through uh, the initiatives so that you have an idea of uh, what it is we are doing at the national level here. Uh, Malaysia has committed to achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, Malaysia has also committed to implementing a domestic emissions trading scheme. Uh, and this is uh, a quick win, if you ask me, acquiring non-internal combustion engine vehicles for all government vehicles by 2030. And of course, uh, on an annual basis, the government uh, purchases and maintains uh, thousands of vehicles. So this is uh, quite a significant uh, signaling of the government's commitment uh, in the context of uh, climate change. We have also made a commitment uh, to maintain at least 50% forest cover uh, in the country. Now, this is a contentious uh, issue, and I will uh, discuss more on this uh, subtopic uh, shortly. We, were, we have also committed to promoting zero waste and recycling, as well as low carbon urban development. And finally, uh, the government has committed to establishing a national GHG center under the Ministry of Environment and Water to improve transparency in climate change data. Now, this is particularly important because as we uh, you know, increase our efforts to address uh, matters that impact the climate, the data is a very important resource. We cannot be making decisions without knowing what exactly is happening uh, around us. So the establishment of this uh, National DAT Center is definitely a step in the right direction because when you have data, when you know what's going on around you, you will then make the right decisions as opposed to making conceptual decisions or decisions based on a conceptual understanding of uh, problems and issues. Next slide, please. So I've been talking about all the commitments global leaders have made. I've spoken about the commitments uh, the government of Malaysia has made. But we also need to talk about some of the issues associated with executing or implementing these commitments. Let's start uh, by looking at uh, this commitment with regard to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. Again, uh, allow me to speak about this issue in the context of uh, Malaysia and the average Malaysian. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, petrol subsidies here. And as a result of the petrol subsidies, the price of petrol per litre is at a particular level. Without the subsidies, of course, it'll be a lot higher. The question is, should we give priority to phasing out uh, fossil fuels and by removing the subsidies and thereby making uh, petrol more expensive, 
the argument is that people would be persuaded to use uh, other means of uh, transportation. However, the average Malaysian still is still heavily dependent on uh, his or her, uh, you know, traditional vehicle to move around. And uh, by removing the subsidies, thereby increasing the price of petrol, the cost of living will go up. And uh, another consequence of that action would be to increase the general price of uh, goods and services because uh, fuel does have an impact on almost every component of the uh, economy. Now, before we uh, you know, aggressively roll out this uh, a policy to encourage uh, the usage of uh, electric vehicles, we must be able to provide the energy sources to charge electric vehicles uh, you know, in every corner of the country. And frankly, we don't have that yet. Even in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, it's uh, not uh, you know, easy to uh, find charging stations. So we do have a lot of work to do in terms of infrastructure uh, before we can confidently say that uh, the country is ready to support uh, an infrastructure that promotes the use of electric vehicles. Now, the next uh, section here uh, relates to the commitment uh, to promote zero waste and recycling. And here, there is a need for a significant change in mindset of the local population. It's no secret then that when we speak about recycling uh, and zero waste, the habits of uh, Scandinavian societies are often uh, brought up as examples. And uh, if you know, our zero waste and recycling initiatives are going to be successful. Uh, as a society, our mindset ought to be at the same level as the mindset of uh, these uh, Scandinavian societies. And frankly, we're not there yet. So there's a lot of uh, education uh, that uh, is required to sort of uh, secure the commitment of uh, the local society to ensure that uh, zero waste and recycling initiatives will be successful. Now let's uh, look at the third box that you see on the screen. And uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, is often a contentious uh, issue. Malaysia, like uh, many other or all other nations, has committed to stop deforestation. But that is the commitment that we have made. But the fact is, forestry remains a significant source of income for many states in the country. Now let's uh, take a look at the current uh, situation. Uh, what is the forest cover percentage in Malaysia today? Well, let's start by looking at uh, what it was in 1990. And uh, my team was able to dig up the statistics. In 1990, the forest cover percentage in Malaysia was 62.8%. And 20 years later, in the year, sorry, uh, 10 years later in the year 2000, it dropped to 59.9%. So not too significant of a drop, approximately a 3% drop. And from 2000 to 2020, the forest cover uh, percentage dropped further to 58.2%. So again, not too significant a drop. Now, that's just the uh, statistics. And uh, we are still quite a long way off the 50% uh, threshold that the government has committed to maintain. But that's just one part of the story. It's one, you know, it is one thing to say that we will ensure at the national level in the aggregate, we maintain a 50% forest coverage uh, ratio. But let's not forget the localized consequences of uh, deforestation. Uh, if we sort of uh, increase uh, deforestation that leads to 
the forest cover uh, percentage dropping by another 1%, uh, at the national level, in the aggregate, we will still be fine because we are way above the 50% uh, hard limit. But what about the localized consequences? It's no secret that forestation does contribute to uh, flooding. And uh, these are not uh, issues that we can uh, ignore on the basis that uh, as long as we maintain the aggregate uh, cover ratio at above 50%, uh, we, will be, uh, we will be all right. Now, I know uh, these are you know, just uh, issues that I'm presenting, but the point I'm making here is that it is important for us, whether at a DFI, a development finance institution, or at the level of policymakers, to be aware of all these issues so that when we make decisions, we make decisions that uh, hopefully uh, promote the uh, competing objectives or competing interests. And in this regard, I would like to uh, bring to your attention, I'm sure many of you are probably aware of uh, the comments uh, recently made by the Indonesian Minister of Environment and Forestry. Now, President Joko Widodo, uh, signed up to the COP26 uh, uh, declaration or a commitment document. However, the very next day, the minister did, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, post a message on Twitter. And in that message, uh, she said that uh, in the case of Indonesia, uh, Indonesia's commitment to end deforestation cannot come at the expense of its economic development. Now that's a very powerful uh, statement in the opposite direction, but I you know, would hazard a guess that uh, this statement that uh, the Indonesian minister made is perhaps representative of the sentiments of many developing nations. Uh, so that is also another debate that will go on for uh, quite some time. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. As a development finance institution, we obviously have to operate in line with our mandate, but that doesn't mean that we cannot keep uh, taking a critical look at our mandate. And this uh, philosophy applies to policymakers as well. And in this slide, the idea that we are presenting is that development planning uh, needs to be implemented with a particular strategy or within certain parameters. And here, uh, the proposal is that we must adopt a systems approach and we also have to sort of uh, focus on building anti-fragility. And I will elaborate on these concepts uh, as we go through uh, the remaining slides I have. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Towards the end of the uh, presentation, I will talk about uh, BPMB's commitment to the UN SDGs. Uh, now, this slide is a criticism of how we are doing it today. But the message here is that the 17 SDGs should not be viewed in isolation, but they are in fact interconnected. Uh, and interconnected in some very interesting ways. Uh, for example, committing to enhancing one SDG could result in another SDG being impacted negatively. And I'll give uh, examples uh, shortly. But what you see here is the clustering of the 17 SDGs. So we can cluster the 17 SDGs into uh, three categories, three broad categories, environmental, economic, and social. So for example, at the top of that diagram, you will see SDGs 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And all these SDGs relate to environmental initiatives. 
And on the right, you will see SDGs 4, 5, 16, 17, and 10. And these all relate to uh, social initiatives. And together, they, of course, uh, promote sustainable development. Can we look at the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, I hope uh, you can make out what is on the screen. Uh, it might be a little too small for some of you. But uh, let me summarize what uh, this slide is uh, meant, or the message that uh, we are trying to convey in this slide. So this slide uh, tracks the uh, SDGs from the year 2000 all the way to year 2015. Right. So in some cases, and this is based on global data, this is not uh, local Malaysian data, this is uh, based on global data. Uh, in some cases, uh, we have made progress. In other cases, we have actually regressed. Uh, let's take one example. If you look at S SDG 11 uh, to the bottom left of that diagram, you will see that uh, in year 2000, in terms of achievement, uh, we at the global level were uh, where that uh, blue dot is, but uh, by, sorry, in year 2000, yeah, uh, we were at a particular level in terms of uh, achieving SDG 11, but by year 2015, uh, we had regressed to where the red dot is. Now, in the case of, uh, Poverty alleviation, and that is right at the top of the diagram, uh, SDG 1, we have made very good progress. Um, so the blue dot shows you where we were in year uh, 2000, and uh, the red dot shows you where we were, uh, where we, uh, yeah, where we were in uh, 2015. So significant progress uh, has been made. And if I can share some numbers with you, as far as SDG number one is concerned, uh, in year 2000, in terms of achievement, we were at 73%, whilst in 2015, uh, the achievement level was at 89%, very good uh, progress. However, as I said, uh, we didn't, as a global community, didn't do so well uh, with regard to some of the other SDGs for example, SDG 9, and I just uh, please allow me to read the numbers. Uh, SDG 9 relates to industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Uh, we were at 19% uh, in 2000, and uh, we dropped to 15% in 2015. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, when we pursue certain SDGs, we have to keep in mind that uh, the pursuit of uh, certain FD SDGs might have an, a negative impact on other SDGs. And let me give you uh, some examples to illustrate what I mean by that. And uh, this is an example from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, SDG number two, is uh, reducing hunger or addressing the uh, problem of uh, hunger among uh, global communities. So SDG number two, or in other words, any society that uh, uh, pursues SDG number two will see uh, a positive correlation, if you will, uh, in relation to SDG number one, which is reducing poverty, SDG number three, uh, which relates to good health and well-being, and also SDG number four, quality education. So let me repeat what I said so that uh, the message is clear. And this is just for the sake of uh, discussion and by way of an example. By pursuing initiatives related to SDG number two, you will also be positively impacting initiatives related to SDG number one uh, with uh, regard to reducing poverty. It will also be positively impacting SDG number three 
in relation to good health and well-being, and uh, SDG number four in relation to quality education. However, pursuing SDG number two, uh, you know, uh, maintaining the same line of argument, interacts negatively with SDG number seven, which relates to affordable and clean energy, and also SDG 15, life on land. Now, it doesn't mean that we should not pursue these initiatives. The point I'm making is that it's important for policymakers as well as uh, development finance institutions and others in general to be aware of uh, the uh, relationship between the various uh, SDGs or among the various SDGs. And by understanding the, uh, so, uh, the, the consequences, we can make appropriate decisions, we can develop uh, the right policies for our respective local communities. Next slide, please. Perhaps I will go to the next slide. When uh, developing or when sort of uh, focusing on uh, development planning, uh, another concept uh, that uh, we should adopt uh, is uh, the concept of uh, anti-fragility. And uh, the best way to explain this uh, will be by citing certain examples. So there are three uh, heuristics that uh, we should adopt. And what you see here are the three proposed heuristics, namely optionality, redundancy, and homesis. Uh, and let's look at the examples. So optionality, and if you look at the uh, example below, it talks about uh, viable alternatives to fossil fuel. So that is the objective, viable alternatives to fossil fuel. But in order to achieve that, we have several options. One is uh, solar power, and the other uh, will be hydropower, uh, hydropowered uh, plants. So this is one example of how optionality uh, should be brought into development planning. <clears throat> and this is just, as I said, one simple example, but we need to apply this uh, philosophy uh, as we think about planning for the future. The next uh, pillar uh, is a redundancy. And here again, the example is uh, quite straightforward. In the context of Malaysia, we uh, in recent years have had problems associated with the graduates not being able to find employment uh, quickly after graduation. And in this regard, what we need to do is to ensure that our schooling system focuses not just on academic skills, but also on vocational skills. So in that way, we will ensure that uh, our students, the future generation, will have skills that uh, are sort of uh, flexible. Because if everyone graduates purely with academic skills, then over time, we will continue to have problems uh, of uh, these graduates not being able to find employment uh, quickly. So that is uh, something that we need to keep in mind when developing policies uh, for the future. And again, this is just an example. And finally, uh, now this is, I have to confess, uh, not something I'm uh, totally familiar with, but the uh, principle or philosophy is that we should introduce low dose challenges. And the example given here is to introduce low dose challenges to agricultural crops to induce uh, adaptive responses that protect them from more dangerous pests or toxins through conditioning. When I was discussing this point with my team, uh, the easy to understand example given was uh, how a vaccine works. So in order to protect ourselves against uh, COVID, we introduce small uh, doses of uh, the virus and that helps us to build immunity. And in that uh, sort of context, uh, 
in, in the field of agri agriculture, <clears throat> we can undertake uh, similar initiatives to protect uh, crops against uh, pests and other problems. So that is an overview of how we need to think about development planning in a more holistic way. And as I said uh, earlier, this is a criticism also against uh, Bank Pembangunan. And we have to make an honest effort to sort of uh, incorporate these uh, philosophies or principles as we think about how we want to operate and serve our mandate 5, 10, 15 years uh, into the future. <laughs> Next slide, please. I will, uh, yeah, thank you. Now, uh, the Malaysian government, of course, has made uh, various uh, commitments uh, in line with uh, the COP26 uh, commitments. And uh, at the national level, we have what is known as the 12th Malaysia Plan. And within the 12th Malaysia Plan, if you have an opportunity to review the plan, you will see uh, a whole series of initiatives that are <clears throat> that, that is uh, very much in line with uh, helping Malaysia uh, meet the commitments that it has made uh, in relation to COP26. <clears throat> I will conclude my uh, remarks by talking about uh, what we have been doing at the PMB. Uh, we, as a development finance institution, need to understand why we are financing certain projects. Uh, a few years ago, we were criticized uh, for behaving too much like a commercial bank. And that was really a wake up call for us here at Bank Pembangunan. So we went back to the drawing board, almost literally, and uh, decided that uh, we have to focus on impact financing in the sense that every transaction that we propose to finance, we must understand the impact it will have on society, on the population, on the country. And uh, to sort of cut a long story short, we developed a, a framework that we call MIND, Measuring Impact to National Development, and we use this uh, framework to assess every project we propose to finance. And these scores generated by this uh, framework indicate to us whether a project has a high, will have a high impact or a low impact. And we use these scores uh, in making the final decision as to whether to grant financing, whether to support a project or otherwise. I would like to stop here. Uh, I have taken a fair bit of time, but I really would like to uh, answer questions if there are questions from either the participants or from uh, the respected moderator. Thank you very much. Insightful uh, presentation, or should I say the conversation that we had today. And of course, uh, we do have a question from our guests here and the attendees. So it's going back from the early slides that you presented earlier in regards to the um, carbon neutral by 2050. So it says here that in the 12th Malaysian plan, uh, one of the goals to be carbon neutral by 2050. In this context, what can uh, the development financial institutions, in particular BPMB, do to boost the Malaysian economy? Uh, sorry, would you mind repeating the question? I might have missed the crux All right, of perfect. it. Perfect. All right. Sure. No problems. Yeah. So in the 12th Malaysian plan, one of the goals is to be a carbon neutral by country by 2050. So in this context, what can DFIs, in particular BPMB, do to boost the Malaysian economy? Okay. Um, thanks for that. Well, the simplest way uh, would be to stop financing uh, coal-related projects, if I understood the question correctly. But uh, at the same time, uh, as uh, people familiar with BPMB would know, we continue to fund the oil and gas sector. So on the one hand, uh, as a nation, we have made certain commitments. And as I said, the easiest uh, way to accelerate 
the meeting of uh, these commitments uh, would be to completely to completely stop uh, coal-based uh, projects. And by and large, uh, at BPMB, we do not fund coal-based uh, projects. However, we do have the oil and gas sector as a key sort of a mandated sector, if you will. And uh, that is in the context of the oil and gas sector being an important component of the Malaysian economy. So whilst on the one hand, we at the bank level have made very strong commitments to uh, sustainability initiatives, we also need to keep in mind that we are a national development bank and one of the key uh, economic sectors is uh, oil and gas, and we have to continue supporting that sector. However, it doesn't stop us from imposing uh, conditions that uh, will help make the sector cleaner. So that's how uh, we would strike a balance uh, whilst uh, remaining you know, committed to the uh, sort of a promises we have made. Perfect. And, of course, it relates to that as well. Uh, since we're talking about DFIs, uh, how about the advancement of DFIs in Malaysia itself? Uh, how does it pair with embracing the sustainability compared to commercial banks, as you mentioned earlier as well, and peers in other countries, aside from Malaysia, of course? Well, there are many ways to answer that question, but let me make, again, an honest attempt to give you uh, a decent answer. Uh, DFIs have an advantage in that we are not driven primarily by uh, PNL, right? So we have been set up with uh, certain mandates and we are expected to deliver on those mandates. And as a DFI, it's important for us to ensure that we remain financially viable, but we are not expected to deliver, uh, you know, staggering financial results uh, year in, year out. And that is actually very helpful uh, in allowing us to focus on, uh, you know, our mandate and helping the nation achieve uh, its commitments uh, under uh, these climate-related initiatives. Now, I'm not criticizing commercial banks. Of course, every commercial bank out there, uh, some more than others, uh, has made very strong commitments to climate change-related initiatives and sustainability initiatives. But what I'm emphasizing here is that when we don't have to you know, focus too much on the bottom line, uh, it allows our mindset to be more in tune with uh, delivering on uh, outcomes that we want to see that might have a negative impact on the bottom line. So that's how I would you know, answer that particular question. So in summary, uh, by design, DFIs are sort of uh, pre-wired to provide the necessary support to help the nation and the various economic sectors achieve uh, these various commitments. Speaking of that as well, do you think banks in general, of course, need a chief sustainability officer of some sort that reports to the CEO or maybe a, a sustainability committee that actually reports to the board? What do you think about this? I think the chief sustainability officer should be the CEO. And that is uh, simply to underscore the commitment of the organization to the sustainability agenda. Of course, uh, we will have uh, the you know, relevant uh, sustainability departments. Uh, we will have board members who are familiar with the concept of sustainability. But uh, I'm clear in my mind that the CEO of an organization of a bank needs to be the chief sustainability officer because it is that important an issue. All right. So um, we're still waiting for more questions. I think we have one here because I'm tuning in to our talk right now. So we have one question right here. And this is a question from Zarif Rashid. And he's asking, 
Besides the criticism to how PBMB operates as being the wake-up call for having an impactful financial framework, as mentioned earlier, what are the other factors that drives BPMB? That's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, of course, uh, sorry, um, that remains a front and center of uh, how we operate because we have to keep reminding ourselves uh, as to what our roles and responsibilities are as a DFI, number one. Number two, uh, it's one thing for the management to make all these commitments. It's also important for every single person in this organization to uh, internalize these commitments. It's not sufficient for just the CEO to uh, you know, believe in these commitments. So that's another very important aspect of this uh, journey. And of course, it goes without saying, and by extension, uh, the board members uh, and the board in general, of course, uh, must be committed as well. Now, at the beginning of my conversation, I did mention that uh, whilst sustainability is uh, front and center of uh, the way we operate, uh, we also focus on uh, other uh, significant initiatives like digitalization. And uh, digitalization is a particularly important, uh, in addition to sustainability, uh, focus area, simply because of uh, the lessons that we learned uh, during the ongoing pandemic. And uh, I think uh, many businesses and banks definitely, BPMB without a doubt, uh, have learned that uh, we need to increase the pace of uh, digitalization in order to be uh, ready to face similar challenges uh, in the future. Of course, uh, we probably are not prepared for every single challenge that uh, might come our way. Uh, if it's a black swan event, uh, there's perhaps uh, very little you can do to prepare. But uh, digitalization at the national level needs to be enhanced uh, because at this point in time, we are not quite there yet. And in order to be a more competitive economy, that's another major focus for us uh, in terms of providing support to businesses that want to embark on their respective uh, digitalization journeys. Well, in that case, but then how does sustainability impact corporate success in that sense? Sustainability is simply good corporate behaviour, plain and simple. And uh, whilst um, over the last two and a half years, we have been focusing on uh, sustainability in relation to the transactions we evaluate and uh, uh, you know, approve, uh, the next phase is to ensure that uh, BPMB itself operates in line with uh, sustainability principles. But in summary, being committed to sustainability uh, principles is simply good corporate behavior. That's something to take note of for all of you watching right now. So of course, Mr. Arshad, uh, for the current moment, uh, I think it's about time that we move on to the next session of the day. But before that, Mr. Arshad, would you like to say anything for all of our viewers uh, out there who's currently watching this session right here? To well, thank you, session for, here, right? yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I, I hope the participants uh, found this conversation useful. But what is also evident is that this conversation cannot stop uh, now. It cannot stop or you can't leave uh, these conversations to just the policy makers. You can't leave these conversations just to the bankers or the corporate leaders. These are issues that impact every single one of us. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the environmental activist uh, Greta, I think the correct pronunciation is Thunberg, and how she has been criticizing policymakers for you know, spending too much time on blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's why uh, these conversations have to take place well beyond 
the uh, you know offices of policymakers and well beyond the offices of bankers and regulators. So I would like to end my session with uh, those parting words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Arshad. And that's all the time that we have here today. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, 